Hello, and welcome back to another so powerful Wellness Collective session. I am Dr. Makita Moore, the founder and CEO of the Soul Powerful Wellness Collective. This is a virtual space to support your mental and spiritual wellness and development. And in today's class, we are going to talk about the power of plant medicine for ADHD. Before we get into the lecture, let's take a moment to do some grounding just to prepare our minds to transition into a space of receiving information. And as we ground ourselves in this moment, you can keep your eyes open or closed. We take this moment just to arrive here. We begin to connect reconnect to our bodies. So let's take a deep breath in and release it out of the mouth. Take another deep breath in. And then as you release it out of the mouth, connect yourself to your body, to the room that you're in, the surface that you're sitting on and allow whatever is occupying the mind just to take a background for a moment. Let's take another deep breath in when you're ready and as you release, clearing the mind, giving yourself permission to be present giving yourself permission to focus on one task. And know that you are safe to just do this one task, to just be in this moment. Now let's take one more deep breath in together, breathing in nice and deep. And then as we release, Slowly coming back to the room, eyes opening, wiggling the fingers and the toes. As we get ready, so if you wanna take notes, you can. Like I said, I will post these notes on the YouTube once that is up. All right, so today for Plant Therapy Thursday, we are talking about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And when I speak about the plants that can help manage the symptoms, and I'll refer to it as ADHD from, from now on, as I speak about the plants that can assist with ADHD, I also want you to consider that this isn't just if you have that diagnosed condition, but also if you're experiencing any aspects of ADHD, okay? So ADHD is defined as a, a neurodevelopmental condition characterized by a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity. And it, and it must interfere with functioning or development. Okay, so when it says neurodevelopmental condition, it means that this is something that you would see present in childhood, right? You would see something that just develops in adulthood, maybe for many of us, we were able to compensate, especially as women. There's a tendency for women to be able to uh, compensate and, and hide, conceal their symptoms of ADHD because there's more of this need for women to be socially acceptable. And um, so we can tend to minimize or, you know, there's, it's more acceptable for little boys to have a lot of energy and be distractible, uh, but for the little girls to be more, you know, relaxed. So there's a higher tendency for women to be diagnosed later in life. Okay. Um, so we have the, the issues with the, the challenges with attention. So there might be difficulties with sustaining attention, maybe failing to give close attention to things, so making careless mistakes, difficulty with organizing tasks, avoiding or disliking to engage in tasks that require you to really focus your attention for a sustained period of time, being easily distracted, and being often forgetful. 
Okay, so those are the aspects of attention that you can see. And now, as far as the hyperactivity impulsivity side of ADHD, this could look like fidgeting or tapping the hands and feet, constant motor movement, often leaving one seat in situations where you're expected to remain seated, um, difficulty engaging in activities quietly or at an appropriate um, volume. Um, so we left off excessive talking, uh, blurting out answers, uh, difficulty waiting one's turn and interrupting or intruding on other people in their conversations. So with ADHD, you can either have a combination of both of these, right? The inattentive side, as well as the hyperactive impulsive side, or you can simply be the inattentive. Um, they also do have the this pre predominantly hyperactive, but that's more so rare. Okay, because I always remind people like that the inattention is, is is hyperactivity, but just hyperactivity of the mind, right? There's so much going on in the mind, it's hard for you to focus. So ADHD can have significant impacts um, on various aspects of life, including academic performance or work. You might have difficulty following instructions, completing tasks, or maintaining your attention long enough to get things done or organization as well, knowing how to start a task, how to create a plan and execute on that plan. There can also be challenges when it comes to relationships, right? That Im impulsivity, the inattention, it can make communication more challenging. Um, and also it, it, it makes it harder to be able to start and maintain relationships. Individuals with ADHD might have difficulties also regulating their emotions. And I'll talk, you know, a little bit deeper about what's happening in the brain and why the uh, emotion regulation piece is happening. Um, mood swings can be common, um, emotion, uh, emotional reactivity, and becoming easily frustrated with others. So the reason why the emotion regulation is more challenging for people who fall under this umbrella of ADHD is because there are differences in the structure of the brain. According to the science, there are differences in the structure of the brain, in particular, the prefrontal cortex, which is this that frontal lobe part of the brain and the limbic system. And the prefrontal cortex, that's our, our higher thinking, our decision-making, um, this is the, the part of the brain that develops that finally, you know, crystallizes when you get to like your late 20s. Um, and this is like when this part of your brain really comes online. The limbic system is more the emotional aspect. So you have a a, a more reactive or a, a, a more dysregulated emotional aspect of the brain. And then the part of the brain that would help to control and manage that isn't functioning at its best either. Okay, so that's why there's that emotional, can be some more emotional reactivity. Um, there also could be imbalances in dopamine and, nor and norepinephrine, which can contribute to mood swings, impulsivity. Another tendency and um, that I, I've often heard about is a sensitivity to stimuli, right? Because with people with ADHD, it's harder to filter out things. So it could just being like taking in so much of the world, it can be um, overwhelming. And that then can really lead to an emotional response. Okay. Um, coexisting conditions. So very often ADHD coexists with other conditions like anxiety, depression, and substance abuse, okay. or substance misuse. And another aspect of the emotion uh, regulation piece is the social challenges. A lot of stigma can come from the challenges um, that people with ADHD experience because you're still, it's not that you have like an intellectual impairment. It's not like, you know, there's something that people can easily say, oh, there's something wrong with you. It's you're trying to operate in a world that wasn't necessarily designed for a brain like yours, 
right? We there's a range of neurodiversity. You know, brains function in different ways. Um, but the the school system that we've all been through wants us to learn in a specific way. And when you put a child who has ADHD in there, they could be brilliant. But because of the way their particular brain works, it's not that they're not intelligent and not smart. It's just that their environment, they need certain things placed in their environment to assist them in their focus. And maybe they need to be learning. So for me, I watch videos in hyper speed. That's how I digest information. You know, sometimes watching it in the normal speed, I get distracted too easily. So if I'm in a classroom, the teacher is speaking very slowly, man, I'm going to be drifted. It don't matter how interesting it is. I'm going to be drifted versus if someone is constantly keeping me engaged. OK, so it's not an intelligent thing at all. You know, I honestly think that a lot of people with ADHD are extremely brilliant, extremely creative because of the way they process the world. Okay. And let's see, um, ADHD can also tend to impact daily activities um, like procrastination, not knowing where to start, um, forgetfulness, and like I said, impulsivity leading to setbacks and mistakes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what's happening in the mind, and then we'll talk about what's happening in the body, so that way we can identify what plant-based solutions would help us. So when it comes to the mind, there is a, an imbalance of neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are basically what's signaling the brain. And these neurotransmitters, like dopamine and norepinephrine, are going to be regulating attention, impulse control, and executive functioning. So when these neurotransmitters are out of balance, you're going to see you know, um, those aspects of cognitive functioning not being um, in balance either. So the key neurotransmitters for ADHD that we're looking at are dopamine and norepinephrine, okay? And dopamine being that reward, um, satisfaction, motivation, and norepinephrine being alertness and attention. Um, so what's also happening in the brain, like I mentioned before, is that there are structural differences in the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And then um, the key aspect of ADHD is deficits in executive functioning. So deficits in that primary cognitive function of the prefrontal cortex, which, uh, which affects planning, decision-making, organization, impulse control. Now, when it comes to the body, what's happening in the body, it's often common for people with ADHD to have sleep issues. Um, or, or disrupt, you know, disrupted sleep patterns or di difficulty falling asleep. And even if you don't have ADHD, but you went a night without sleep, it is, it's much harder to function cognitively. It's harder to focus. It's harder to think clearly, right? So if you have ADHD and you're having a hard time falling asleep and staying asleep because of these neurotransmitter imbalances, so you're, it's just kind of creating this cycle of impairment, right? You can never really catch up. So this is why being able to add in different plants to support can be very helpful, okay? Um, also what's happening in the body, you might see more motor restlessness. So like restless leg, fidgeting, twitching, um, maybe pulling hair, skin picking, tapping things. That, that sense of restlessness, the need to move. Uh, let's see, appetite and weight changes. Um, they might, people with ADHD might experience changes in their appetite, whether it's increased appetite or loss of appetite, especially when there's medication involved. I know a lot of people who, who've been use, utilizing stimulant medication to manage their symptoms. And the first thing they all report is like they've lost a whole bunch of weight because they're just not, they don't have an appetite to eat. Okay. Um, but can also eat, lead to overeating, that, that impulsivity, that sensory sensitivity. It can also lead to overeating. Um, there can be issues with coordination and motor skills. Okay. Um, and then one thing I definitely experienced growing up was um, I had a lot of like injuries and accidents. Like I was always running into like 
doorways. I was always forgetting things, places. It's because I wasn't present. I was in my mind while trying to operate in the world. So I, and just not aware of where I was in time and space. So I'd be running into things and having all these little little injuries and, and accidents. Okay. Um, this is definitely important, like, you know, for people who are driving, you know, being, being aware I used to do so much in the car, man, I mean, do, changing clothes, doing my makeup, doing the <laughs> while I was driving down the highway, you know, trying to get to work on time because I, I had poor time management, you know, could never get out the house on time, no matter it was the same time every day, you know. Um, so there's, there's so much value in better managing ADHD symptoms because it can be very impairing and dangerous. Oh my gosh. Um, just really quickly, my son is diagnosed ADHD and I'm just, everything that you're saying is so true about him. I worry about him. Well, it's, it, I hate to say I'm numb to it because I'm really not, but kind of am. But my son has been in so many car accidents mm. just where he, it, it's just, it's amazing. Um, it, the things that you're saying are blowing my mind because they're so true. And when I first learned about this, when he was a child, people would call me crazy and they would tell me that it wasn't true, that they were, it's just a conspiracy against black boys and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, when, when, when was the last time you read anything? So I hate that because the children that do that, don't, unless they have a parent and really involved parent like me, they don't get the attention and the services that they need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't agree with every psychological diagnosis out there, but I do know that there's a difference. And it's not saying that this is a broken brain. It's just that this brain functions differently. And there's a certain characteristic that can kind of lump a group of people, a certain part of the population together who share those challenges. Um, yeah. Cause I, like for me, it takes a, it takes more effort than the average person to be present and be in a conversation without my mind being like inspired by a word and just going off and was like, wait a second, sorry, I missed what you said. I'm here though, you know. So it it, it definitely is. Um, there's something something there, something happened there. Yes, thank you for sharing that each. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead. Um, oh, let's see. Let's go over the, some of the consequences real quickly. If we don't manage ADHD, you know. Um, and as far as management of ADHD goes, the approaches can be, you know, behavioral therapy, like learning skills to manage the symptoms, um, psychotherapy to deal with maybe the lack of self-esteem, the low self-esteem that often comes with it or the social difficulties. There's medication, right? Some people will need that medication in order to be able to, to function, um, there's plants like we'll talk about that. And then there's, you know, things like mindfulness, um, physical well-being practices, right. That gives us this holistic way of managing, um, ADHD symptoms to where for some people, you know, it's, it's no longer, you would no longer meet criteria in that these things are still there, but they're no longer causing you significant distress or impairment. And that's the key thing that will, a psychologist will give you a diagnosis is, does this cause significant distress and impairment in your life? So if you can utilize the tools to reduce it, then it's just a difference of the brain structure, but it's no longer a disorder causing a disorder. Okay. Um, so when we don't manage ADHD, which I have some clients who are just like, this is just how I am. I just live in chaos. I'm like, you don't have to live in chaos. Okay. Um, it can impair your work performance, make it hard to reach deadlines to achieve your goals to, you know, take action on your dreams, especially if you're someone who decides you want to move away from the structured corporate world and you want to be an entrepreneur, right? You have to figure out how to manage your mind if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, okay? And, and the lack of that can lead to underachievement, loss, loss of job, a lot of job changes, financial instability, okay? Um, unmanaged ADHD can also put a strain on relationships with friends, families, partners, colleagues, that impulsivity, forgetfulness, difficulties, listening and emotion regulation can lead to misunderstandings. You know, I, I often want to apologize to people who would talk to me most. I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but you said something, my mind went off. And then by the time I came back, I lost the spot. Can you please repeat what you said? You know, or 
Um, I'll open a text message and then something will distract me and I just don't respond at all, you know. Um, but you you learn different different tricks and stuff. And again, the more you meditate, the more you become aware of these things. And it makes a huge difference. A huge difference. Uh, let's see. Mental health issues. Like I said before, ADHD is, is very common uh, for people with ADHD to also begin to experience anxiety, depression, substance misuse to try to cope with the difficulties, um, as well as trauma, you know, because there is that tendency to engage in impulse to be impulsive or engage in risky behaviors, right? So then that can set the stage for mishaps and things that could be problematic. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get into these plants. So I'm gonna make sure we get everything covered in time. Okay, so we're gonna start with internal things that we can consume to help support our brain health. Okay, and as a reminder, we're thinking about the prefrontal cortex and the limbic emotion uh, regulation part of the brain. So berries, right? Berries um, are rich in antioxidants and antioxidants help to reduce oxidative stress and inflammation in the brain, which can overall improve our cognitive function, which is our thinking ability and our memory. Okay, so we're not as forgetful. Um, leafy greens like spinach, kale, and broccoli, these are high in folate. Um, and folate is essential for neurotransmitter regulation. So that dopamine and norepinephrine regulation. So this could impact our mood as well as our alertness, cognitive alertness. We have citrus fruits like oranges, grapefruits, and tangerines. The citrus fruits are rich in vitamin C, which is another antioxidant. Uh, which supports a healthy immune system and may be a protective factor for brain health. Again, whenever we can reduce the amount of oxidative stress happening, the better off our health will be. And oxidative stress is just something that naturally occurs as cells die. It's like the waste product. But if you aren't, if your body isn't healthy, it's not able to remove that waste product as easily as it's supposed to. And there's more of a buildup of that waste. And then that causes inflammation. Inflammation causes more waste. And you kind of, you know, you're in that cycle of more things dying than, than growing. Uh, we also have avocados, right? These are a nice healthy fat, um, omega-3 fatty acid. And these are important for brain health as well, as, as well as um, things like almonds and walnuts. Those also go into that category of, of uh, healthy fats. Olive oil as well. That's one thing that we haven't I haven't covered yet is the oils. So olive oil as well. Um, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are rich in vitamin A and C, as well as fiber. We got our sweet potato lady up in here. <laughs> uh, and they're beneficial for overall health. Um, vitamin A supports um, brain development. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, and which affects that um, oxidative stress. Let's see, magnesium. Some vegetables like spinach, kale, and avocados contain magnesium. And I like using magnesium as um, a way to regulate mood, but also to regulate the body. So this way you get deeper sleep. So for people who are having, you know, if, if sleep disturbance is a part of your ADHD makeup, having a magnesium-based powder or consuming things that are rich in magnesium, like watermelon, I believe mango as well can help support that relaxation at night so that we are getting better quality sleep. And uh, we have carotenoids found in orange and yellow fruits and vegetables like carrots, sweet potatoes, and bell peppers. Uh, carotenoids are another antioxidant. Um, and I, I'm trying to think about this in turmeric as well. Okay, so, um, Again, the, the important thing is reducing that inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain. Okay, so now let's get into mushrooms, which are my favorite. So there, there are, um, there's been more and more research looking into the power of mushrooms for brain health. And the and for those that relate to the symptoms of ADHD, um, in particular, we have lion's mane mushroom which actually stimulates um, nerve growth in the brain. Um, so 
if you are having oxidative stress, something like lion's mane mushroom can help to balance out that. Okay. And it's also a lot of research with lion's mane and like um, for neurodege neurodegeneration, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, reishi mushrooms, um, they are a good antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Uh, cordyceps, these are associated with improving energy levels and performance. So if you're looking for a coffee replacement, cordyceps is your mushroom. And then chaga mushrooms, um, these are antioxidants and have various health benefits, okay? If you go to Sprouts, they have like a mushroom blend, like the OM, the OM um, brand is the one that I use. And that became my coffee replacement was this mushroom mix. And um, okay. All right. So now it's getting to some teas. So, you know, when we think about ADHD, ultimately we come to this idea of this hyperactive energy, hyperactivity in the body, hyperactivity in the mind. So, you know, intuitively we're going to go to herbs that help to bring calm. Okay. Calm and focus. Okay. So chamomile. Chamomile tea is great, a great stress reliever and a great anti-anxiety. Um, lemon balm tea, because lemon balm has that mild sedative effect. It can help to calm the nervous system, help with some of the restlessness. <clears throat> Peppermint tea. Okay. So this is going to help with alertness and clarity. Or you think about like when you smell peppermint, how that makes you feel, it makes you feel alert. Uh, so this can help with focus and concentration. We have lavender tea. We all know that lavender is that, that herb that helps us to relax and feel calm. So you can either take this during the day if you're feeling jittery or use this at night to make sure you get a deeper, you can fall asleep faster and get a deeper sleep. And the last tea we had was valerian root tea. Uh, which is another uh, herb that has a sedative effect. Okay, so this one can also be used to improve sleep quality. I often, most often I'm doing the chamomile. Um, I used to be afraid to do it during the day because I thought it would make me too sleepy, but I realized that it does just kind of give me a, a calmer state, especially when I'm in times where I have a lot of pressure a lot of things on the plate, a lot of things happening. I just write everything down and I have me some chamomile tea with some nice honey in there. And that helps to keep me a nice, you know, kind of steady energy. Put on some calming music, maybe that new Andre album and just, you know, float, float through the work day, you know, <laughs> set the vibe. Okay. All right. Let's get into the herbs. Uh, so herbs that can help to manage symptoms of anxiety include ginkgo bilboa. So ginkgo is believed to improve cognitive functioning and circulation. And circulation, uh, you know, the, the brain consumes so many, uh, it consumes so much energy, burns so many calories. So we want to make sure that it is being supplied with as much nutrients as it needs. So ginkgo, bimbo, ginkgo can help to improve circulation so that way our brain is getting everything that it needs. Okay. Um, ginseng can help to improve attention and cognitive functioning. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, passion flower. Uh, passion flowers don't have calming effects, which can help to reduce anxiety and promote relaxation. And then Rhodolia rosea, um, this is one of those adaptogenic herbs that can help to um, help you to better respond to stress. So and reduce um, fatigue as well. So since you're you're able to better respond to stress, stress is typically what can contribute to chronic fatigue because you're in that constant state of fight or flight. So this can help to improve um, any type of energy issues as well, fatigue issues. Okay, and we are moving on to, so those are our internal remedies. So the foods, the fruits and vegetables, 
the teas, and the herbs that can support. Now we're going to move to external uh, remedies. So I'll start with our essential oils. Um, lavender, of course, you know, lavender has a calming and relaxing effect. It can help to reduce anxiety and stress and promote relaxation, helping to manage restlessness and hyperactivity. We have frankincense, uh, which can be very calming, promote a sense of relaxation and tranquility. Cedar wood. I really, really like cedar wood. I think we use this. Yeah, we use this one um, when my friend was, she was doing a home birth and we had some cedar wood to create a calming environment. Uh, so cedar wood is, it has a grounding effect, which is good when you're so active in the mind, you need something that, that will help to ground you in the present moment. So cedar wood has a grounding effect and brings on a sense of calmness and focus. Uh, we have peppermint essential oil, right? That said it. That um, scent that gives you the sense of invigoration and can help to stimulate you, give you mental clarity and alertness. I, I will do this in the morning when I wake up. I'll put some on my hands just to get me started. Or if I'm um, feeling a little mentally uh, uh, fuzzy, you know, maybe I didn't get good sleep that day, so I'm a little mentally fuzzy doing some peppermint. Uh, we also have lemon essential oil. This is another one that's more of an uplifting, kind of energy giving scent. Um, also, lemon can tend to, sometimes with ADHD, especially when combined with anxiety, there can be a lot of stress, a lot of focus on on all the things that are going wrong. And the, the lemon scent, it's so uplifting and it's so light. Um, at least I know for me personally, it's it's so uplifting, it's so light, it just makes you want to smile, it makes you think about the sun or you know something joyful. So I always love, and I and I do like to do a combination of the lemon and peppermint together. A really nice scent. Uh, and then we have Lang Lang essential oil, and this has a very calming and sedative effect. So it's helpful when there's stress and anxiety to help bring some more emotional balance. Okay. All right. And a new section that I added on this week is house plants. Okay. So what, what plants can we bring into our house to support us? Um, of course, lavender. You can bring in the lavender flowers. Um, you know, you can find a sunny spot in your house. because they, they do need sun, a good amount of sun. So just find a sunny spot in your house. You can lavender plant. That way you can benefit from the scent. Um, snake plants. These are good for purifying your air and they're really resilient. So if because of your ADHD, you're always forgetting to take care of stuff, the snake plant is a very resilient plant and it will still be there looking green and beautiful even if you forget about it, but it's not for too long. Okay. Um, the peace lily, and this is another one too, they, they thrive well on their own. Um, the peace lilies are known for like these, these really big white flowers and, and big green leaves. Um, they create a kind of serene environment and which can promote a sense of calm. We have aloe vera, which is another air purifier, just like the snake plant. Um, let's see, spider plants, another plant that's easy to grow, another air purifier. Um, and then we have jasmine. Jasmine gives us a very sweet, calming fragrance. Okay. And uh, jasmine is often associated with relaxation and stress reduction. And then finally, we're going to close out with nature, um, the role of plants in nature. So spending time in nature, going for a nature walk can help you to develop the skill of mindfulness, mindful awareness. This is one of the keys to uh, minimizing the symptoms of, of um, ADHD and gaining better control is mindful awareness, being able to observe what the mind is doing and then being able to direct it in the desired direction. So just going out and just noticing, okay, look at, you know, how many plant, uh, leaves can I see or, you know, how many flowers and you know, just spending time in nature, focusing on being in the present moment and observing 
noticing when your mind begins to drift out of the present moment and bringing it back. Um, gardening is also another way in which nature can support us, right? Because gardening requires your present attention. It also requires planning. It requires organization. It requires consistency. These are all skills that are great, great to develop. Um, it also gives you that, that sensory, you know, doing something with your tactile, with your hands. If you're someone who's, you know, you experience more of the hyperactivity um, symptoms of ADHD. And even just spending time in nature can help you to concentrate more, to develop the skill of focus and concentration. You know, maybe you are foraging, you're out foraging in nature. So you need to be able to pick up, you know, and, and notice, you know, the slight uh, changes in foliage or, or things like that. Okay, so nature can definitely support us. Sorry, I'm being eaten up by these mosquitoes in here. All right. Okay. So that is going to, that's going to be the, the end of how our plants can support ADHD symptoms. And again, this doesn't mean you have to have ADHD to benefit from these, but even if you have difficulties with attention, you know, or organization or um, just overthinking, right? These herbs, these plants can support you as well. Okay. All right, all right. So I'm going to open it up for questions or comments, and then we will close out. Thank you so much for joining us for this session of the Soul Powerful Wellness Collective. I hope that this information brought you value and is helping to further expand your mind and elevate you mentally and spiritually. If you would like to join us for our next class, visit drmkita.com forward slash S-O-L to join the Wellness Collective, and we look forward to seeing you there. Sending you peace, love, and light upon your journey. Stay soul powerful.